Thank you guys. Hey, welcome uh, to Real Life Church. My name is Brent and I'm, so, I, first, I just got to tell you, I'm so humbled and blown away by Real Life and um, just this place, uh, these people, uh, you're incredible, so hospitable. My son is here with me this morning and somebody swept him away and like, hey, we're going to give you a bunch of food and candy and stuff. And so just really grateful for your hospitality and really, really, really grateful to be here uh, together. You got to know this about this church. Um, Man, you are a part of a church planting movement up and down the coast of California and bringing real hope in a real tangible way. Um, I get to serve at Slow City Church in San Luis Obispo, as Kevin said, and um, just really cool to to see what God is doing um, in and through your church all over the state. Um, If you're you're here for the first time ever and you're like, what in the world is going on? Um, Or you're here for the first time in a long time, I just want to tell you, like, this is a safe place a real place. That's what I love about the name of this church, real, authentic, vulnerable, transparent. This is a safe place to come, ask questions, kick the tires, uh, get to know somebody. Uh, You belong here, and I'm so grateful uh, to get to be with you here this morning. Uh, I love driving down the 101, actually. I love road trips, and uh, I love coming down the 101 or taking the 126 to turn up here. Uh, Sometimes if I'm really brave, I'll take the 166. If you know that road, it's chaotic. But um, I love coming with my family. They love Magic Mountain. It's growing on me. Um, uh, But I... I love just being in the car with my kids and my wife, turning on the music and listening uh, to songs. And so uh, th- this past Thursday, we came down for Thursday night service. Um, and I heard a beat as my son was talking. He's exploring colleges and different things. We're talking about college. I heard this beat that caught my attention. It's this. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> yeah. Dun, dun, dun. And I'm like, wait, 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 Keegan. And I turn it up. It was, it, it's not Vanilla Ice. It wasn't Ice Ice Baby. It was the original. It was the original. Queen and David Bowie. And I'm singing that song. Pressure, pushing down. Right, right, I'm not, and he's looking at me like, Dad, we're, we're, it's only us, but you're embarrassing me. We turn up Queen and David Bowie and we're listening to this song. And I start singing the song. Have you ever read the lyrics to this song? It, it made me inquire. What, are, what am I even saying? What am I even singing? I just want to read you the lyrics. Pressure, pushing down on me, pressing down on you, no man ask for. Under pressure, that brings a building down, that splits a family in two, puts people on streets. Right? That's okay. That's the terror of knowing what this world is all about. Watching some good friends screaming, let me out. Pray tomorrow gets me higher. Pressure. da 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 right? Under pressure. I'm singing this song and I'm like trying to get my 17-year-old to like actually like smile and I'm hitting him and I'm singing this. And then the words kind of sink in and it hits me. This is deep. Like this song is real. Like this is real life. There is a pressure in life, isn't there, that can push down on you where you can feel it in your heart, your soul, your relationships, like the building that you are standing in is caving in all around you that splits relationships, that puts pressure on marriages. And we look around the world and we see people on the streets and we see good friends saying, man, just get me out from underneath this pressure. There is real pain in the world. There is real division. There is real divorce. There are, there's real disease. There is war. There is angst. There are all these cultural opinions and pulls and right and left and middle and all of this angst. And did you know, 2024, we're going to have an election this year. You guys ready? Ooh. Like there are kids. There are bills. There is inflation. There is real stress and anxiety and pressure. And what do we do under pressure? Right? What do we do under pressure? Uh, you've, you've probably heard the story of the man who took his three-year-old to Target, Brave Soul. Had his three-year-old son in a shopping cart, and he's pushing his cart, and his son is lo- losing his ever-loving mind. He's screaming. He's grabbing toys from the shelves. He's throwing them. Everybody in every aisle is watching this dad, questioning his parenting, and he's just walking through the aisle as his son is just screaming bloody murder. And he's walking through the aisle, and he's saying, Teddy, it's going to be okay, Teddy. Teddy, just calm down, Teddy. Teddy, be patient. Teddy, we're almost to the checkout line. Teddy, Teddy, deep breath. Teddy, we're going to be home soon, Teddy. And this mom who's had had kids of her own sees this dad and is recognizing the pain and the anxiety that he's feeling and how he's handling it. And she approaches him and she says, sir, 
I just, want to, I just want to tell you, man, you're doing an incredible job just like being there for your son in the midst of everything that's happening. And he looks up with wide eyes and he says, he's not Teddy, I'm Teddy. <laughs> Have you ever felt stress, pressure, the perception of other people like something is in front of you that is imploding or exploding that you cannot control and you're feeling all of this pressure, what do you do? Do you go to self-talk? Teddy, just make it one more step, Teddy. Just get to the end of the line, Teddy. Just get home, Teddy. Do we, what do we do? Do we just coach ourselves through it? Or are you crushed under the weight of it? Studies have shown in the wake of all the pressures culturally around us that 42 and a half million Americans suffer from an anxiety disorder. That is real. One in three suffer loneliness. That is real. 60% struggle to feel like there is someone in their life that knows them well. That is real. Six out of ten of us in the room struggle to feel like, man, they really know me. Depression is higher today than during the COVID-19 pandemic at 30%. We are in a time, in space, in this place where we are all feeling it. We're all feeling it. You're feeling it. I'm feeling it. We're all feeling it. We're all in this together. We're all in the same boat. One in three of us feel loneliness. Six out of ten of us feel like nobody knows us. A lot of us struggling with anxiety and pressure. And what do we do in the midst of it? What do we do with it? And why am I talking about this at church? As a church, you've been journeying through the story. And today we're at chapter 18. And we hit a real time and a real place in history. Um, and specifically, it's, it's hallmarked in the book of Daniel. And we're at this book of Daniel. Um, kind of journeying through Daniel's life and his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And today we're going to discover a time and place of real pressure, real opposition, real oppression, real anxiety, real nervousness, real feel, re fear, sorry, overwhelmingness, and all of these feelings. And we are going to see a group of people step into resilience, step into a grit, a resolve, a strength as they encounter pressure. So we're going to see the pressure that they're under. We're going to see them take a decided posture. And we're going to see them discover a real hope that I pray is challenging and encouraging to your heart, to my heart, as we're here together. Let's read Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. If you have a, a paper Bible, you can open up to Daniel chapter 1. Um, or if you want to follow along on the screens, or if you have a Bible app. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, it says this. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia. And Nebuchadnezzar put um, in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach these young men the language and the literature of the Babylonians. Then Nebuchadnezzar assigned to them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter Nebuchadnezzar's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. There is this pressure that we see in the first setting of the scene in the book of Daniel. The Babylonians are coming up against Jerusalem and Judah. And is, the Babylonian Empire is led by King Nebuchadnezzar, who was a great and terrible, egomaniac, moody kind of king. He ruled from 605 to 562 BC. And he was infamous for his power, for his conquest, for his ego, for his destructive, oppressive force in his attempt to build his empire. And that empire comes up against Jerusalem. The Babylonian armies roll in and besiege Jerusalem and flatten it. And there is panic everywhere. There is confusion everywhere. There is this sense of chaos everywhere. And notice, 
Where does Nebuchadnezzar, where does Babylon go first when they hit Jerusalem? They go to the temple of God. They go to the place of worship. They go to the church. And he walks into the midst of the church where these articles that were so near and dear to their faith are, are, are held. And he takes these articles, he takes these emblems, and he takes them from the temple of Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of Moses, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He takes these articles from the temple of God and he carries them out through the streets and he places them back in Babylonia. Why would he do that? Because Nebuchadnezzar is after their belief. And if he can institute fear, if he can mock God, if he can create doubt, discouragement, he can, he can kill their belief. He's ultimately after their worship and their trust. So then he comes to the best and brightest, right? Physical specimens, high individuals of high intellect who are well-learned, who are teachable, um, and namely Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And he takes these individuals and he carries them back to Babylon. And there is an attempt to reform them, right? We read that they were fed a new diet. They were taught a Babylonian language. They are forced to read Babylonian literature to ensure that they learn this new lifestyle. Why? Because Babylon is after their identity. Babylon is after the very nature of who they worshiped, after the very nature of who they are at their core. Babylon was after this had this three-year plan to indoctrinate and reclaim their identity, to fill them with the ways of Babylon. In Babylon, we trust. So did you notice they give them new names? Daniel chapter 1, we read the chief official gave them new names to Daniel. And you just have to know, the name Daniel means God is my judge. His name is defined as God is the one who I stand before. God is my judge. And his name is changed to Belteshazzar, which means Bel's prince, this pagan god. Hananiah, his name means beloved by God, beloved by the Lord. I am defined as a loved one of God. His name is now changed to Shadrach, means, meaning illuminated by the sun god. Mishael, his name means who is as God, reflecting God. His name is changed to Meshach, who is like Venus. Azariah, his name, defined by the Lord, the Lord is my help, is changed to Abednego, the servant or slave of Nego. Do you see what's happening? They are given new names. Their belief is attacked. There is this attempt. Their identity is under pressure. And they are renamed in, a, in an attempt to reform them, to make them conform to the ways of Babylon. So get this pressure. What do you do in that environment? Imagine for a moment, like we wrap up church here, you head to brunch, or you, help, uh, you head back to watch the game and the ground kind of shakes beneath your feet, tanks roll in, helicopters fly over, you are picked up from your home, you are taken to a faraway land, you can't eat the same food, you can't read the same literature, you are forced to worship or pressured to worship pagan gods. How do you react? You're pulled away from your family and you have to know this about Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. If you are enlisted in service to King Nebuchadnezzar, you are most likely made a eunuch. You're most likely castrated. That's why we don't read of Daniel's lineage, his kids. What do you do with that kind of pressure? You're renamed, you're reformed, you're forced into these things. How do you handle that? What do we do when Babylon besieges us today? Do we just kind of go to like a, some self-talk? Brent, you got this. One more step. Do we go to like a, a new workout routine, right? I'm on a new workout routine in January. It's not going super well, but I'm trying. 75 hard or keto or you hit a hot yoga sesh. But we just like kind of pull up our phones and scroll endlessly through Instagram reels, fail videos, sending them to our wives. Or when you are under pressure and everything besieges you, do you just kind of pour another drink? Just make it another day. 
Just get through another day. And if you are here at the end of your rope, this is the right place to be. Historically, we have a tendency within the church, and I'm just talking to church people. Historically, we have this tendency within the church, when the ways of Babylon besiege us, when our places of worship are attacked, when our temple, the articles of the temple are carried and, and we are forced into pagan rituals, that there is an attempt to either, a tendency in us to either isolate, instigate, or participate. We can often isolate, just kind of bubble ourselves off, create these secret clubs and these, like we just kind of hide and duck and cover and hope that they don't find us. We can often instigate. We pull open our keyboards and we become Instagram, Facebook, Twitter warriors where we're attacking everyone. We can pick fights. That's that fight or flight, isolate, instigate. But I also notice we often participate. When the ways of Babylon pressure us, we can either isolate, instigate, but we often participate. You know what? It's just too hard. So I'll just blend in. I'll just take the form or conform to whatever identity or look that that Babylon says I should take or look. But what if there's a different way? In the book of Daniel, we see Daniel and his friends under pressure, but take a completely different posture than isolation, instigation, or just participating. We see them dedicate themselves. We see them find a resolve. We see them find a determination that holds them together even though their bodies have been mutilated, even though they have been given new names, even though they are forced to read different literature, they are dedicated. They take a posture. Read this in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. It says, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. So he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. We read that word resolved. Daniel resolved. That word means to decide firmly on a course of action. He had predetermined, predecided that he was not going to defile himself. He was not going to stain his heart. He was not going to warp or distort his thinking. He was not going to forsake his worship. He had this resilience and grit about him, this resolve. Sometimes we think about resolve as kind of this word that says I, something that I'm choosing not to do. And Daniel absolutely does that. But he has this resolve that leads to a course of action. Under pressure, he has this resolve that directs his steps, that gives him this ability to withstand pressure, to have this toughness, this grit this resilience to remain who he was. Uh, I'm a big NFL football fan. Any NFL fans today? All right. Any Ravens fans today? (laughs) I know I'm in a weird Kansas City Chiefs area around here. I'm not sure what's happening. Um, I'm a Cincinnati Bengals fan. Who day? I'm there. All right. So I, I love reading about like athletes who just like have this grit and determination. You know, any big, uh, accomplished, larger than life, like Hall of Fame athlete has a routine and has a dedication and has a resilience about it. I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky and used to read about the great Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay, who was just built different, right? And I was reading recently about an NFL player named Darrell Rivas. And Darrell Rivas is considered one of the best NFL DBs, cornerbacks of all time. And he had this interesting quote about pressure that I really love. He said, the only way you handle pressure is to apply it. You know, if you're a cornerback and you're st- he was usually stacked up against the best wide receiver on the other person's team. And, and there's a lot of pressure when you've got a lot of speed and agility and power coming at you. And he said, the only way that you handle that pressure is you get close. You, you push back. You apply some pressure. In basketball, I grew up with a coach. And if we ever had an opponent press us, put on a full court press, he'd say, our game plan is we're going to press them. We're going to press a pressing team. Sometimes you can attack a pressing team by pressing back. And I love that line. The only way you handle pressure is apply it. It makes me think of headaches as well. I get some gnarly migraines every once in a while. Actually, the last time I was here after the, after the last service, I had a blowout migraine. I sat in the McDonald's at Fillmore for an hour with ice on my head. It was a beautiful scene. But I've learned some things about migraines and tension headaches. Did you know there's pressure points on your body? 
And there's a pressure point between your finger and your thumb. And if you press on this with a tension headache and you apply pressure here, it alleviates some pressure here. I don't know why. I'm sure some of you know some pressure points that you could walk up here, touch me here, and I'd just drop on the floor, right? But I love that line. The only way, that principle, the only way you handle pressure is to apply it. When you are feeling squeezed, pressed, you push back. And this is the resilience and the resolve that we see in Daniel and his friends. Because they press into some things. First thing they press into under pressure in Babylon is they press into prayer. They press into prayer. We read in Daniel chapter 6 verse 10, Daniel always prayed and always prayed to God three times every single day. Three times every day, he bowed down on his knees, got on his face to pray and praise God. It was a part of Daniel's routine, even in a land of exile, even when he was not at home, even when he could not go to church, even when he was not around people, he had a routine, a rule of life that I am going to pray. It was a priority to him. Why did he pray? Was he trying to get something from God? I'm sure there were things that he was asking God for. But why do you pray? Brian Zahn says this about prayer. He says, the primary purpose of prayer is not to get God to do what we think God ought to do, but to be, but to be properly formed. But to be properly formed. The primary purpose of prayer is to be formed. And Daniel and his friends are in a time and space where the world is pressing in on them. The stresses and pressures and anxieties and depressive thoughts and discouragement is starting to put this pressure on them to conform, to fall in line, to be reformed. And so Daniel says, I'm going to pray so that I can be formed and molded by God. I'm going to put my heart in front of God and say, God, change me. Make my heart look like yours. Make, help me to see the world the way you see the world. Help me to respond. Give me your patience. Give me your grace. Give me your truth. Give me your love. Give me a grit. Give me your toughness. Mother Teresa says of prayer, prayer feeds the soul. As blood is to the body, prayer is to the soul. And it brings you closer to God. She says, prayer is this place where we are fed where we are shaped, where we are molded, and where we gain closeness with God. There's some guy named Rusty George, <laughs> and he says this. This is why we pray, to align ourselves with what God is up to in the world. To say, God, I know that the world is pushing me all over the place and my steering wheel of life is going all over the, and the winds are blowing, and every, but prayer is the place where I line up with you. See, Daniel has this routine, this rhythm of getting on his knees three times a day and pouring his heart out before God and saying, God, give me your heart. Help me to know you. Help me to be formed by you. Give me what I need. Give me strength and sustenance as if blood is delivering oxygen to every part of my body. Would you give me enough to get through the day and would you line me up with what you want me to do and what you want me to say? And it formed and aligned who Daniel was. I don't know your prayer life, and I'm not here to judge it. I'm not here to get, make you feel guilty about it. I'm asking you the simple question that I ask myself every day. What does my prayer life look like? And what would it look like to prioritize prayer this year? In a pressure-packed, opinion-driven, politically charged climate, there's stuff happening at home, there's stuff happening in your finances, there's stuff. what would it look like to prioritize prayer? And to say in the morning, in the middle of the day and at night, I want to be formed by God. What if you just made a decision today to just say, I'm going to, this is going to be, this is my resolution in 2024. This is my resilience in 2024. Daniel pressed into prayer and he also pressed into community. One time in Daniel's life, the King Nebuchadnezzar comes to all the wise men, all the teachers, all the well-thought, well-educated individuals, all the magicians, all the, you know, crystallizers and all these different people. And he says, I had a dream. I need you to tell me what I dreamed and what the dream that I dreamt meant. And if you do not, I will have you killed. And everybody's like, whoo. There's a little nervousness happening in everyone. And Daniel hears this news. And he doesn't just sit on his hands by himself. He doesn't just stay by himself. He doesn't just pull out a scratch pad. Scratch pad. He presses into community. He actually goes to the house where Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah are sitting. And he 
And he says, guys, I need you. Daniel chapter 2, we read it. He says, then Daniel returned to his house and explained the crazy request of the king, the matter, to his friends. And he urged them. He begged them. He was with them. And he, he asked them, would you go before God pleading for mercy from the God of heaven? Ask God to give me the wisdom. See, he didn't do it alone. He leaned into relationship with God in prayer and into relationship with others. And I know there are some, like, relationships are difficult. I know it's really easy to throw up the walls and to keep everybody apart. But we did isolation. We did shutdowns. We did six feet apart. We did all that. It wasn't good for you. It wasn't good for me. I need people. You know this, but us is stronger and better than I. We is greater than me. Together is greater than alone. Being with somebody is way better than being without somebody. And, and Daniel and his friends pressed into community and found resilience. The Gottman Institute writes on this, and they simply and powerfully say, social isolation weakens resilience. Social connection strengthens it. We know this. Secular science and psychology and everything is saying you need connection. You need us. You need a we. You need together. It strengthens you. So again, who are some people in your life that you could go to when you feel pressed? Where's a garage? I know I could go to that garage and I have those friends that will sit out in that garage with me. I know I could go to that fire pit. I know I could go to that living room. I know I could call these friends. They would meet up at that coffee shop. I know I have some people. Do you have some people? Could you be that person? Could you be that somebody to somebody else that could share the load? Would you press into community when you are pressed? You've read Proverbs 27, verse 17 that says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. We all get dull. We all get down, we all get discouraged, and we need one another to keep us sharp, to remind us of our true name, of our true identity, of what really matters. You can find somebody that tells you everything that you want to hear, but do you have some people that tell you what you need to hear? Press into community. Last, we see them, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they press into faith. They press into faith, and faith not being just this cognitive belief, not like Santa Claus. I believe in Santa Claus so that I get good things. But this, this, this real determined reality, Martin Luther talks about faith and he says this, faith is a living, daring confidence in God and in God's grace. So sure and certain that a person could stake his life on it a thousand times. Faith is a living daring confidence and assurance that God is who he says he is and God's grace is enough. And that sureness, that confidence, that certainty, it leads you to be able to stake your life on it a thousand times. Faith is this thing that it's a trust, it's a dependence, it's cognitive, but it sinks down into the heart and it changes who you are, it changes your behavior, it changes the place that you stand. And if the world is a hurricane blowing all around you, you have this faith and this confidence that your feet are on solid ground, that the anchor of God holds because you know that there is a God who created everything. There is a God who knit you together piece by piece, who knows your name, who calls you by name and says, you can trust me. You can believe in me. And we see Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, all stand on faith. They press into a belief that determines their action, that determines their posture. So one of the most famous stories in Daniel is the story of the blazing furnace. King Nebuchadnezzar, in an ego trip, builds a big, huge, golden image statue, calls everyone from everywhere. He says, hey, I've got some trumpeters and when the trumpets, they go, bop, 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 bop. You know, like when they, when they start blowing the trumpets, I need everybody who hears the sound of the trumpet to bow down and worship this man-made image that I have constructed. But there were some who were determined not to lose themselves in a cultural moment. There were some who decided to remember who they were. And we read that they did not bow down. They're pulled in front of the king. 
And he gives them one more chance. He threatens them. And in Daniel chapter 3, we read, If you do not worship this image, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace of fire, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand, one way or the other. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image that you have set up. We see these friends pull together. They are pressed, but they are not crushed. They lean into prayer. They lean into community. And they stand on a faith that says, we don't need to defend ourselves. Did you notice their posture when threatened with being burnt alive? They said, your majesty. They weren't rude. They weren't defensive. They didn't have this defensiveness that was like, I'm going to hurl insults back at you and mock you. They said, your majesty. We don't need to defend our Defensiveness doesn't look good on anybody. But what they carry in them is a dependence, a determined trust in God. They say, we do not need to defend ourselves because we know the deliverer. We do not need to defend ourselves because we know the deliverer. We know the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We know Yahweh. We know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And no matter what you can throw at us, no matter what you throw us into, we believe that God is able to deliver us, whether from the fire or in the fire. That is resilience. That is strength. That is those are some individuals that know who they are, knows, know whose they are. There is a resolve there that I want. Can I ask, what fire are you facing? What pressure are you up against? It might be relational, it might be in your marriage, it might be internal, it might be emotional, it might be spiritual. Just some pressure, some weight, some anxiety, some hardship, some anger. Maybe you're angry this morning. And you're just up against the fire. Would you, would you press into faith in the midst of that pressure? Press, in, press into trusting God? Tim Keller says this, it is not the strength of your faith, but the object of your faith that actually saves you. I'm going to read that again. It is not the strength of your faith, but the object of your faith that actually saves you. See, you don't need to be a perfect Christian that knows all the whole of Scripture and all the deep Greek, Hebrew inner workings of everything and you've got everything spelled out and you know every Like you don't have to have this. But the object of your faith is the thing that gives you strength. What is the object of your trust? What is the object of your faith? Uh, last year we had a young lady come forward after service who said, you know, about a year ago, um, I had this vivid dream and I didn't know what to do with it, so I came to church. I'd never been to, she had never been to church before in her life. She started watching on YouTube a little bit, listening to the messages. She came, she sat with people, she recognized some friends from, from work and from school and um, she just kind of soaked up the worship. The worship was weird and to her and she's just trying to figure out all this stuff out and the messages and she said, finally, I just had this moment where I feel like I just heard the voice of Jesus call my name. And I felt it like I was the only person in the room and he saw me. And she stood up and she came down to the front and she gave her life to Jesus. And I met her there and she said, I don't know how to describe this, but I just met Jesus face to face and I want to trust him as my Lord and Savior. I want to be forgiven. I want to be set free. I want to have a life of meaning. I want to have a life of purpose. I want to have a life that holds me together. I want to have a faith. So we prayed with her. A couple weeks later, she was baptized. I just want you to know, if, if you want to make that decision right now, it just takes you saying, I just, Jesus, I receive you as Lord and Savior. He sees you in your seat. This young lady was baptized in our church and then she faced a fire. She faced some pressure. She was born in a strict Hindu family. And when she went home to share her faith with them, she faced threats. 
They threatened to disown her and excommunicate her, her mother saying to her, you are no longer my child. And this was tragic, this was hard, this was confusing, there was all this squeezing, but what I noticed in her in a short time was this rootedness, this steadiness. It was hard, it was tense, there was pressure. She stood before our church and she said, I know Jesus. He saved my soul. And I love my family. I love my mother. I love my father. And I can't turn my back on the one who saved my soul, the one who put me together piece by piece, the one who took the cross to deliver me. And I notice this resilience in her that I, man, I so want. I notice a faith in her that held her together. This past Christmas, she went home and she lovingly, respectfully, honestly shared her testimony of coming to know Jesus with her mother, her father, her aunts, her uncles, her cousins. And she shared of a deliverer and she's still living in this pressure, but she's pressing into prayer, she's pressing into faith, she's pressing into community and she's found a hope. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, they are pressed, but they are not crushed. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into the fire. Bound up, thrown into the fire. That's where their faith led them, into the fire. And Nebuchadnezzar and all the governors and all the satraps and all the people are gathered around and they're like, wait, didn't we throw three guys into the flames? Because we see three guys walking around the fire and another one in the fire with them. And so Nebuchadnezzar calls into the fire and he says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out. And as they walk out, walk out of the fire, everyone is stunned because their clothes are not singed. They still have hair on their heads and they are shocked. They do not smell of smoke. And notice Nebuchadnezzar's response when he realizes that the God who Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel serve is the God who delivers. Notice what he says. He says, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship anything else, any God except their own God. Listen, I don't pretend to know what you're up against today. I don't pretend to be an expert on how to, how to coach you through life. And I don't know the pressure and the anxieties and the thoughts that you're wrestling with, the stresses but I know mine. I know the anxious thoughts that can run rampant in here, especially at about 4.15 a.m. I know the feelings in my chest when I feel like I can't handle life. I know the worries over finances for my four kids and over their well-being. I know the difficulty of a broken family and praying for my family members who are trapped in alcoholism and I know mine. I don't know what you're up against, but I do know that there is a God who is with you and I in it. And that when we are pressed, we don't have to be crushed. We don't just go to self-talk. We just don't go to another routine. We can press into prayer. We can press into community. Would you join a group? Would you show up to Alpha? Would you grab somebody next to you and say, let's grab coffee and just, what's your story? Would you step into togetherness? Would you join a recovery group? Would you stand, stand firm in your faith? Would you receive a faith today? Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we are hard pressed on every side. We are pressed on every side, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed and confused, but we are not in despair. We will not be overcome. We are persecuted, but we are not abandoned. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. Therefore, we do not lose heart. 
Though outwardly we are wasting away, but inwardly we are being renewed by the Spirit of God day by day. For our light and our momentary, our temporary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs all of our pain and all of our pressure. So we will fix our eyes on Jesus, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We fix our eyes on Jesus. Jesus, we pray to you now. We are pressed, but we press into you. Would you give us eyes that look to you? Would you give us hearts that lean on you and on others? And would you help us to see Jesus that you stepped onto the planet and you were pressed You were crushed. You were pierced for our iniquities. You died for our transgressions. You set us free from our sin and our shame. And you meet us in the anxiety, in the pressure, and in the pain. And we can lean on you in the midst of all the worst the world and Babylon has to throw at us. Help us to know our name in Christ. Help us to to find faith in you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.